Hello and welcome to the Photo Brigade podcast. I'm Robert Kaplan. I've got another friend and podcaster, the Fro Extraordinaire, Jared Poland. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for lunch. Well, you're welcome. We did sushi again. Yeah. When in doubt, eat sushi. Yeah. I, th I appreciate you uh, coming by. I, I know I've been trying to get you back on to, to do the video. You were on my podcast previously. We, we did a we actually did our podcast over sushi yes, we last did. time you were here, but that was before I went... Uh, video. So yeah. very cool. Um, before we get started, I just want to say thank you to Adorama for letting me uh, continue my podcast here in their event space. I know it's not quite as comfortable as the, the fro loft. Um, no. The chairs, we there's, need to work on the chairs. There's no Herman Miller chairs here, which is what I, we, we sit on, my butt only touches those at home. <laughs> well, uh, luckily you'll be able to, you know, use those when you get back and feel the difference. Sometimes you don't see the stars until it gets real dark at night, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, that's stupid. Um, Fault in our stars? You do kind of look like John Green. Have you heard that? So people have been saying that to me lately. That's I just realized that because you just said fault in our stars, and I was like, oh, oh. oh okay. you kind of do look like him. Well, um, so uh, bef before we get started with you, because there's so much I want to talk to you about, not just about photography, but, but m uh, more about uh, your branding ability. You've, you've created this, this brand, I Shoot Raw, which you're wearing right now, which you're always wearing. Um, it's even on dates. E even on dates? Yeah. How does that go over? I mean, it's, I, they still either end up coming back with me or not. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it all depends on the day of the week. No, I, I, I don't know. I try to wear, I like wearing my, it's, it's it's my own thing. Yeah. 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 You get used to it. All right. Real real quick. Thank you also to Canon Professional Services for your support, Temba Bags. Um, and uh, that's that. Okay. So um, before we start, uh, you know, I'm, yeah, I just, I, there are things that are going on in my head that I'm out of respect not saying. Yeah. There's a couple of jokes I had already that I'm like, <laughs> this isn't my show. Don't say anything offensive because these are your <laughs> sponsors and this is your home of doing business. I was going to say something about Herman Miller because. Hey, maybe maybe they'll hear. Maybe they'll hook us up with chairs. I don't know. You need those high stools. They're like twelve hundred bucks a piece. Oh, my God. Yeah. Can we get that? No, I doubt it. Ben, we'll talk, talk to the manager. Um, so uh, I want to talk about your website a little bit. Yeah. Um, you the, on, on your main page here, my your personal your website. personal website, jaredpoland.com. Um, first of all, enter me. It says enter me. It says enter me. But this is this is your loft in, in Philadelphia. You're you're from Philadelphia. This is my first loft. Oh, in this is your first. Yeah, first this loft. was a 2,600 square foot awesome place that I rented for a little bit. Uh -huh. That had a stage and everything. And uh, yeah. Uh, so um, and let, let's talk a little bit about how you got into photography because beyond uh, now you're you're a, a major. You're almost like a media industry company yourself right yeah. now. Well, I think you need to be a media company when you enter the world of the internet. Um, but you started you started as a photographer. I was talking with my friend uh, Tiffany, who I guess sold you your first camera, apparently. Uh, you saw on Facebook. I well, don't know if you know her very well. Yeah, but. Tiff, she didn't sell me my first camera. But I, I also went in when I went. She was working at a place that's no longer in business now. And um, I used to go in there and give film. And when, like, I know she when she first started working there, I didn't trust her to give her my film. Yeah. I'm like, is the other guy here? <laughs> just, yeah, I got used to the other guy. Right. And, uh, and so tell me about how you got into photography. I know you, what, the schooling, schooling you went through, did you get it? Did you, did you, well, yeah. I started at 13. At 13, okay. Yeah. So I picked up a camera at 13 and just thought it would be, the reason I started shooting is I was at a, a, a junior high school basketball game. Uh huh. And it was pregame and I saw these girls taking photos for the yearbook and I thought what they were doing was a terrible job. Yeah. Just from the looks, I'm like, well, why aren't they shooting action? Why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? So instead, I, I, I went home, got my mom's point-and-shoot camera, a Fuji Discovery 1000 or something uh -huh. like that, came back for another game, and took a roll of 36, black and white, and just crushed it. Yeah. It, it was, and, and that's with a delay of a camera. You know, it's a point-and-shoot camera. You press the button, you don't get a shot. Right. You press a button, you have to anticipate when the shutter's going to go off in a camera like that. And so I, I, I was able to anticipate the moment, capture the images, and came back with a ton of really good timed sports photos of course the camera was doing all the work it was setting all the settings it's a point and shoot but i'm a big proponent of telling people that you know i can teach anybody to shoot i can teach anybody the settings if you don't have the eye it's much harder right and so i i had that early on right um so a lot of it just became trial and error i taught myself right in, a, in, a, in an era before digital when you don't know what your settings are 
when you get your film back and you go, well, why did I mess or how did I mess this up? And you had no way to know. Right. You had to try to remember because I never sat there. Everybody was like, write down your settings. I'm like, no, I shoot sports. I'm not doing that. <laughs> But then again, the settings would probably be about the same. Yeah. So, so you you ended up, you know, working working your way through high school, learning it a bit. But you ended up you you went to school at Antonelli. I did. I did. Tell, uh, yeah. Yeah. Tell me about Antonelli uh, Institute and um, you know what it was like building a you know portfolio through them. It's beeping. Ha. Ah. So through um, can they hear the beeping on the on the feed? I don't think that you can hear it on the on the feed. Right. Sorry. Yeah. I'm just ignoring it. I know. I'm, I'm blocking to. it out. Uh. This is prof we're professionals. We're professionals here, not uh, me, obviously. So through high school, I had three years of photography, which is pretty rare. Uh -huh. um, and I'll get to the Antonelli in a second. But the way I was able to do three years is in 10th grade, they were like, you need to take a language. And I was like, no, I'm not taking a language. They're like, You won't get into college if you don't take a language. I'm like, I don't want a language. Mm -hmm. I want to take photography. Mm -hmm. So I did my first year there. Then I had advanced photography. And then I had the uh, independent study in the senior year, which is basically a waste of time. But when I um, decided to go to Antonelli, it was a it was a two year photography school. Mm -hmm. the The decision with my parents was, uh, this is a two year photo school. You don't need any of the other BS. Why spend two years of general learning on something I instead of just focusing on what you want? Right. So that was a choice then. I mean, we're talking. I graduated pre nine eleven, so it was ninety nine. I graduated high school, and then by two thousand and one September, I was already out. Okay. Because uh, it was a two year. So school. you're two years older than me. I didn't realize that. I am? Yeah. You're not older I than me? I was 2001. No shit. Yeah. Old man. I guess. Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Well, what You're can I say? You're super successful, though. Well so, well, so you are, too. So I have something to, to look up to. Um, it, and I should say that uh, when I decided, so we, we both have these, these podcasts. Our podcasts, I'd say, are pretty different from one another in that, well, we do have guests. We talk to photo industry po folks and everything. But your podcast is like, Super fun. You have all sorts of you know fun segments. You have photo news, which is really cool, uh, and you and you have um, you know co-hosts essentially, yeah. which is a, a different sort of banter. Um, and and when you do your your interviews, they're usually kind of like a separate segment that you add on later, isn't that? We put them. We we cut them in instead of doing flying solo, which is where I ask a lot of questions. At, so right after photo news, we would jump into a thirty to forty minute interview right so we we do record it usually before just to get the guest in and out right uh, but then we cut it into the show there yeah yeah um so when so what i was saying is that when i st first started thinking oh you know i i, I want to do a podcast I, I looked up photo podcasts and yours was the first one that popped up and i remember i was on an airplane and i just downloaded a handful of them and just sort of cracking up listening to it i i would uh consider the difference being like if i was npr like terry gross you'd be Howard Stern, you know, you, you yeah. got you got a personality, you've got visually, you got this character and everything going. And so how how tell me about how you grew this persona that you've got the persona or the podcast? Which one? Well, let's let's start with the po well, I guess the, the, the persona should start. Persona was I had the hair a couple years before I started Frono's photo. Right. Um, the hair thing just was a, a challenge to myself because I never let my hair grow because it got weird after about two or three months it would look weird uh -huh. you know, all these jewish curls and and, <laughs> and all of this stuff and then i just stuck with it right and and then the brand happened when i was i went to some internet marketing events as a photographer uh i didn't spend money to go to them i'm not a big fan of people spending money for that stuff uh, -huh. uh and i and i just ended up i ended up with an idea that mm -hmm. i was going to create a site and it was going to help people buy gear and they'd pick up a gear through the affiliates and that's how i would make money it would be free and i had to come up with a name and that's i was just tossing stuff around and was just like frono's photo looked it up and it was originally the frono's photo <laughs> but you know what sounds cooler drop the the right so i dropped as the facebook the, did as facebook did so uh yeah instead of the frono's photo it just became frono's photo yeah and i own both of those addresses but that's it, it, it started off with the idea that i would get more jobs as a photographer that I would put out my work, share it with the world, and then people would call me to do jobs. And how'd that turn out? Uh, it didn't. It didn't. What ended up happening is people right away latched onto the educational part. They started saying, I've got questions. We look to you as being the expert because we see your work. We see that it's good, and it, you, it, you know what you're talking about. And so people then started to ask questions, and I pivoted that direction really quick. Yeah. It was just, okay, you're asking questions. I'm going to make content because every question that comes in is an easy way to make a piece of content yeah which is a lot of people put out one video a month 
one video a week. I just knew I wasn't going to get traction right. that way. So the idea early on was YouTube. Let's beat the shit out of YouTube. This is cursing show? That's fine. Let's beat the shit out of YouTube, and YouTube is owned by Google, which means you're going to win search. People always talk about SEO, and yep. there's all these companies that try to sell you on, you need to do this, and we'll rank you first page, and most of that's BS. I think most of those companies are BS, because mm -hmm. what you do is... You just tag things properly. You use common terms. You use keywords, you know, all of these things. And so building the brand became, I want to make a video every single day. Some days I would make two videos. I'd wake up in the morning, shoot something, edit it, put it out, go do lunch, come up with another idea, shoot it, edit it, put it back out mm -hmm. by the end of the day. And that wasn't exactly sustainable. And so if you go to froknowsphoto.com, you can just sort of see all the different types of content that you are that you put out. You don't just put out... Well, now you're also doing live videos. You're using all the different Facebook, live, Facebook live, Snapchatting as well. Using all the different types of social media, but you have begin these guides, these educational guides, the and and all sorts of stuff. It's not just your um, your yeah, podcast, which five is minute portraits, real world reviews, which are reviews where people well, where I actually go use a piece of gear instead of sitting in a studio and taking pictures of a chart, right? Which is what a lot of reviewers do, which is that that has its merits in certain ways for certain people. Uh, I just don't find it interesting to see somebody shoot charts right. at DxO, namely shooting charts and testing stuff like that. Go out and shoot pictures. I don't give a shit what camera you have. You can shoot anything anywhere. There's limitations behind it, but you should be able to capture great images no matter what tool they put in your hands. Right. Absolutely. Um, so let's see here. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about was was sort of that, that transition. I mean, how much... It, tell me about how where you went from being a full-time shooter because now you you still shoot you shoot the things that you want to shoot because yeah. you're you're sort of subsidizing that by building out your brand yep. right so i want to talk about that that sort of transition from you know building this brand and then how it sort of turned into this being more of a full-time job and and are you W did you ever expect something like this to happen? Would you know? Is it so? Just give me an idea of, of what this transition's been like for you. Well, I, the hopes was that I would get more photo jobs, right? Because I was, I've been shooting since out of well, I've been shooting since thirteen. Sure. But out of college, you know what it's like. You're picking up odd jobs here and there. You pick up some good ones, and then they all of a sudden pick somebody else to do it for no reason. You're uh -huh. out. Uh, and you shoot, you shoot weddings, and you're making money. You're making a living. Mm -hmm. But the site was to ho to help me get the jobs I really wanted. And like I said, it, it didn't really happen. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> well, well, so so the transition from going to uh, be, being a full timer, the, yeah. yeah. That. Um, you know, I love business. I love branding. I love marketing. That is a love of mine. A lot of people like photography as their alternate thing, and so for me. Photography was what I did as a professional. And when I started the website, I had no idea that it would turn into what it turned into. Mm -hmm. I just went with it as it was happening and then figured out how to make it work monetarily while still having a free website, make money so that I can sustain myself living out of my dad's, you know, my brother's bedroom at my dad's house for yeah. a bunch of years because yep. I lived at home and, and, just, and just figuring it out. There's a lot of people that will say, well, you're not a full-time photographer. You're not a working photographer. And, I, and my answer to that is, is that's true at this point. Right. I'm running this, and I love running this. And I think that it's the goal of 99% of the photographers out there. Their goal is to shoot whatever they want when they want and not have to worry about getting paid to do it because that's what photography is all about, mm -hmm. shooting what you want when you want. Now, if you can make money while you're doing it, that is absolutely incredible. So... That's the point I'm at. I love build, building brands and business. Mm -hmm. That's a, a passion and a love of mine, and photography is right up there with it. Where did you get this business savvy? Was it, do you have a business partner? Do you, is, is it run in your family? Well, I am Jewish. <laughs> you know what they say. I, I am too. Well, I, what do I, they say? No, I don't know what they say. <laughs> that, the, that the hair's blocking the horns on top of my head? Oh, right, yeah. I don't know, something like that. Um, well, I, my dad is a salesperson, uh -huh. a shmata salesperson, which you know a shmata? I don't know a, a shmata. A Yiddish a shmata. A shmata is a rag. Oh, okay. He was a children's wear clothing salesperson. Oh, okay. Um, and so I grew up as a five, six-year-old sitting in his office in, in Philadelphia, 801 Arch Street, listening to him sell the wares to prospective buyers. Interesting. Stores, yeah. The Strawbridges, the 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 you know, all those different companies that were out there. I can't even think of a boss cops and all that. And so I would just listen to how he was honest with his with the people. If he didn't like a product, 
he's like, don't don't buy this. I don't like this line this year. I don't like it. There's uh-huh. other things we could work with you. And just listening to how he was selling, honestly, really taught us a lot. Yeah. He also taught us uh, taught us a lot. When I say us, my brother and I, um, just a lot about sales. And, and and a lot of it happens just because you see it happening. Uh-huh. And when I went and sold cameras at a camera store, right. it he told me remember this like the fatal alternative i'm like well what's the fatal alternative he's like well you give people an option and they either take it or they don't uh-huh. but at least you you start to figure out whether they want it or not because you could you have tire kickers they come in and they ask questions and then they're not going to buy from you they may buy from online so the question was if you want to try to close a deal give somebody the fatal alternative you say would you like the 16 gigabyte card or the 32 gigabyte card and instantly some are you guys listening back there the salespeople here? <laughs> no, instantly, people then have to decide, are they going to want the, the 16 or the 32? Oh, I'll take the 32. You know you made the sale. Or they'll say, I'm not ready to buy today. And at least you know that. And you can give them your card and say, come when you're ready to come back, right. purchase. So just it's just a feel. Yeah. Sell the sizzle, not the steak. Don't sell them every, you know, oh, this is the greatest camera in the world because it has 233 megapixels and shoots 87,000 frames a second. Nobody cares. You care, you know, the mom comes in. Do you want to take photos of your kid running around playing soccer? This is going to let you do that, and let me show you how. Yeah. You know, just yeah. common To me, it's common sense. It's interesting you said this about your dad hearing your dad on the phone because I have a lot of that also. Being in the car, my, my father is a uh, real estate guy, so he's talking – land broker talking to these people and, and it really is just about you know and i learned a lot of my business savvy so going on on this uh, bandwagon of, of business um one of the things that's really important i think for photographers these days is to diversify not just in the the genre of photography that they're working at currently whether yeah. it's editorial commercial whatever um but their clients and everything but also beyond photography itself so i know that for instance, you you and I have talked about uh, investments in real estate. Uh, one of the things that you have your own um, property here in uh, Philadelphia where, that you've turned into a workspace, um, and you've got a new property that you're uh, looking to you're building up right now into a, a factory. What do you call it? We'll call it the Fro Factory. The Fro Factory. Just a place to create. A place to create. Um, what is it? You know, how has that affected? Uh, that's not the right question. Um, what would you say, uh, how important has that been, do you think, in your business uh, so far? Do you think that was a really great move? Do you feel that, that people should look into these types of investments? Well, I think that in the photo world, in this day and age, you need to diversify what you do in order to be successful. And that includes shooting video. That includes editing video. It includes knowing marketing and branding and social media because the photographer kids coming out of school today, you're not going to get a photo job at a newspaper. Or if you do get a photo job at the newspaper, you're probably going to run the social media and all that as well. Right. That stuff is extremely important to learn. Now, in terms of the, the buildings and the property stuff, I mean, when I first started, I had nothing. I had like $2,000 in my bank account and I had a credit card that I m- was going to max out uh-huh. because they gave me 15 months t- zero financing to pay it off Mm -hmm. and I made sure that I did but that's how I started the business I had enough money saved up from shooting weddings which I liked doing but didn't like doing Mm -hmm. you know when I was shooting them great the two years leading up to somebody to actually shooting it pain in the ass Mm -hmm. right but I had saved up enough that I could risk it and I was also living at home Mm -hmm. which not everybody has the same opportunity to live at home and not really have the expenses Um, diversifying is extremely important and also with photographers there's some photographers out there that that have made it in other careers first that have built up enough money. They were either lawyers, doctors, they were uh, real estate, they invested in real estate and made money that way right. that end up becoming photographers or their wives are the breadwinners, which is perfectly fine. But a lot of photographers have been able to, s- to make it because they've done other things first that allow them to not make enough money right away that they can sustain themselves. That's one of the things that I didn't realize when I started. I didn't realize that I thought you're you're a photographer. You're going to make money. That's what you're going to do. And it's not the case. A lot of these guys made money from other things. Cool. Um, So uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, I Shoot Raw. Yeah. You've built this brand, uh, sold a lot of shirts. I've I've seen you doing your Facebook live videos and everything, which has been awesome. Um, And you have sort of a warehouse of of clothes and everything. My dad's Uh, basement. And look at this. You've even got all these wristbands and everything. How many products? How many SKUs do you have? Too many. Too many We need to redo the store. 
the store needs to be totally redone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is it, so at the beginning, did you did you started the store and that maybe was more of your? Uh, it's how I made revenue, money. How, how you made money then? Well, yeah, because I wasn't making money on YouTube. Right. And 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 so I knew that bands made money selling merch. I toured with bands. I'm like, I need my own merch. Came up with I Shoot Raw. Put that shirt out. Had one shirt. I would sell small, medium, large, extra large, and I think that was it. And the shirts would sit on my brother's bed in his bedroom, and then I would get an order. This, the, the coolest thing was I had the printer, this big-ass printer, in my bedroom. Uh -huh. And through the wall, I ran a wire so that it was connected to the, the computer on the other side. And when an order came in, it automatically printed. So in the middle of the night, I'd get these orders. Like, one order, and I'd wake up, and I'd be super excited. I'm like, <laughs> this is the coolest thing ever. People are – like – one person bought a shirt. Right. I mean, it wasn't a lot. Yeah, but and, it's and, exciting. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was exciting. So then, when you would get six and seven in a day, you kind of move the printer out of the bedroom. So I finally moved the printer. But then, what my dad would do, he'd walk down the hallway in the morning, he'd look at the orders, and he'd be all excited, seeing that I was making money on the internet. That's awesome. And, and the shirts, I would, I sold them originally for eleven ninety nine. That cost me probably eight dollars to make at the time, and I just reinvested the money into buying more. So instead of buying forty-two at a time, I now bought seventy-two, and I hit the next level. So my discount, everything started everything to kick cheaper, in. Yeah. The, as you as you buy more shirts, blanks, they cost you less, and then as you print more, it costs you less per shirt. Right. And so you get it down to a point. Now I sell at fourteen ninety-nine, and there's people that are trying to sell my same shirts, which is kind of a dick move but they can't match 14.99 for the quality and for the actual authentic shirt right and so i don't try to my goal isn't to make money off of merch anymore it's to get more people just enjoying the brand more people and that's into why the community that's yeah. why i sell them for 14.99 or do a random sale for 10 bucks from time to time uh -huh. just to move product uh -huh. and you don't make as much but it's not about that it's about getting people interested and in, 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 in involved right um so you you went from sort of this one-man operation working out of your parents house yep. to now having a staff or, yep. or a couple small like a, a small staff yeah um when did you know it was time to to grow that staff and, and not be just just you so the the easy answer uh is when when there's jobs that i shouldn't be doing that uh -huh. were taking up the majority of my time so i couldn't focus on creating anymore that's when you know you need somebody uh -huh. and i talked to a bunch of successful business people and I'm, and and i kind of thought the answer already and that's why I don't like asking for a lot of advice sometimes because it just seems like common sense. And the simple answer was when you're when you're being taken away from the things that you should be doing and you can't do them, you need to hire somebody. Right. Um, so I tried somebody. It didn't work out too well the first time. Uh, and then Stephen came along, told me my audio sucked on my podcast yeah. and was like, I'm going to make it better. Yeah. I'm like, all right, somebody take an initiative. All right. <laughs> He's been Fine. he's been a great addition. He's Steven's been great because not only did he he originally just did the audio on the podcast, and then he found his way onto the t at to the t at the table doing photo news, and then I would send him back to do audio, and after photo news was done, and then it just now he, then he became a part of it. Right. And because he shoots it, he sets up everything, all the lights, all the cameras, all, the, and he runs the audio and he edits all of it in post. Right. So he cuts it all together. It's his baby. Yeah. Um, because of that, and and so. He came on full time almost two years ago, and you can see that the five minute portraits we do have become better. A lot of the quality of the content has become better. Yeah. Um, there is, of course, that if the content is good and the quality of the video sucks, it doesn't always mean that it's bad. Mm -hmm. We know that. There's a lot of people that walk around with iPhones and make a have some of the largest YouTube followings you could ever see. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. But for for me, it's about making bigger, better content, making it quality and consistent, and just crushing really good content so anyway it's a small little team right steven's full-time going to probably be adding another full-timer shortly uh todd who's also on the podcast is more on retainer because he helps with managing putting together the shoots uh -huh. so that everything's organized because i'm not a big fan of organization but i also see how easy it is once you organize stuff properly right so that's it i'm looking to add more editors so right. I can put out more content than everybody else and continue to do that. And and so and one of the really cool things is that you've been getting a lot more into education, putting out educational content, yeah. um, more so than just the Raw Talks, which are well, educational the in talks, themselves. The educational content has always been there. Yeah. Raw Talk is only at 174 episodes. Uh, so it's 
the reason we were going to get back into the podcast, why I started the podcast, yeah. is I wanted to invade people's ears. <laughs> I've already done YouTube and have a pretty large following there. Yeah. I'm like, well, why, why not get into their pockets and, and do that? And then what happened is after a couple episodes, it was it was suggested that I only do audio because that's what podcasts are. And I'm like, well, that's bullshit. I've got this like 300,000 at the time subscribers on right. YouTube. I'm like, I'm going to do video. Why wouldn't I right. do video? All these people are here engaging. Just give them the video. And so then it evolved into the video podcast part. Right. And that's what it should have been from day one. The audio can go up on you, uh, on on uh, iTunes and all the podcast networks, and people can listen if they want to engage that uh -huh. way. But I, it's a visual. We're visual. I want to do a show like a TV show. How, that's what we do. How do you grow an audience like you have? I know there was a podcast a while back. I don't know, obviously, which one it is. Maybe I can figure that out and drop it in the info below. But how do you grow an audience on YouTube? What kind of tips can you give? Even even me. I mean, yeah. we don't have anything near what you, consistency. you have. Consistency. To me, consistency. It, came, it came down to consistency and doing something different. When I started Sniff Tests, running around my backyard, doing weird stuff, I don't do as much of the weird stuff anymore, which I debate from time to time right because i i enjoy that i think it you know you've got your shtick you have your thing that gets people coming back for more but a shtick is just a shtick if you can't back it up right and if people aren't going to continue to engage with you they're not gonna if, if i was just if you're just like a viral video sensation where you have a viral video and then people they're not going to subscribe because you're just hitting them with one video you, right. how do you how do you follow it up right so with for me building the brand and building the audience came down to consistent quality content there was one to two videos a day. It still averages 1.2 over the last six years, which is pretty insane. Wow. Um, and interacting with the following, answering their questions and comments. Now, it's harder to answer comments today because there's thousands of them that come in a day across 2,000 videos. Right. And some people get upset. But also, the more people that watch, the more haters you have, and the people leave stupid comments and I don't want to get sucked into the right, bad comments right, right, right. because that you could have a thousand good comments and one negative one and that really affects your day. Yeah. It really does. It really does. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> it's and stupid. so you try not to let it bother you. So I don't read a lot of those comments so I can't interact as much. The best way to interact with me is Twitter. I will try to reply as much as possible. Plus they only have 140 characters to do it in. Instagram's a great way to do it. Facebook messaging, not a great way to do it because well, most of the questions come in are like, I'm looking to buy a camera. What should I buy? Oh, yeah. It's interesting. On the, I've noticed on uh, Facebook, on the actual pages, on our not on our personal pages, but our professional pages, they yeah. start rating you based on your message time. Have yeah, you noticed 18%. that? Yeah, 18%. I think I'm at 16% reply over really? three hours. Yeah, I'm like, screw you, Facebook, and you're telling me that I need to reply quicker. If the questions that came in were pertinent, <laughs> I would do it. Oh, but, yeah. but I, I, you know, I had to turn off the, the, the fro email address thing from questions to the fro because it became too much about gear what should i buy and i don't want to answer what should i buy questions yeah and yeah and I, it would be good but sometimes people are asking questions that they could just find simple answers to i know they're looking to me as if i'm google for the well, photo you're also world. not a salesman well i, mean, I am a are. salesman but i'm not beholden to any store other than the, you know alan's camera which is a small personal store right the mom and pop that's small but i, I it's because I wouldn't be where I'm sitting today if it wasn't for Alan at Alan's. And Canada. that's what happened. You that's how you really got your start in networking and everything. You would just hang out at the store, right? I would I would well, I worked at the store uh -huh. for a minute. Um, the way that it got started is that Alan would let me come in and unbox and sniff test gear. Uh -huh. Stuff I could get my hands on it. Yeah. And then we were able to get some advertising revenue from some of those companies that he was just it was just going to waste. Right. And because when you own a store, you can then get uh, co op funding, which is I'm sure most people don't understand how that works, but every dollar they or every three dollars they spent, they could get one dollar back to spend on advertising. I don't even know what it is, mm -hmm. but something like that. And if you don't use it, you lose it. So Alan was able to help me by letting me use that money. That helped sustain me as I started. And so having somebody like him give me access to that and help me get money to keep doing what I was doing was a was a was awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's talk about your use of social media yeah. in general. Uh, we've talked about you know YouTube, we've talked about your the blog, we've talked about the, the podcast and such. Um, social media is so important these days. Yeah. Um, well, for, for folks like you that have a huge audience to be able to communicate with that audience, but also just for promoting yourself. Sure, um, you have to ask for the sale. What are the most, is it important to use all of them? Is it is, is there one that you would recommend that you use the most over others? Are there some that you don't believe in that you think are overrated? Well, Vine. Vine. I mean, six-second videos. I don't think 
really has a place for me, but it may have a place for somebody else. But if you had a million followers on Vine, it would have a place well, for you. Well, of course it would. Yeah. But here, Periscope, I think Periscope is a waste for me personally. Well, because, now that Facebook does it. Well, Facebook Live, when I go on Facebook Live, when I was at, at the Nikon event in Vegas and uh -huh. they were announcing the, the D5 and the D500 and that 360, whatever the hell they call that camera. Yeah. The VR key camera. Mission, right? uh -huh. Key Mission 360. What a, what a name. Uh -huh. um, they weren't even broadcasting their own event. I sat in the front row and Facebook Live the damn thing, and, w and there were 3,500 people watching live wow. for an hour. And if I was on Periscope, I'd have 80 people watching. Mm -hmm. It's because I don't have a following there. Now, that may be good. My Twitter following's I don't know, 60,000 or something. But Twitter is a fickle place also. Yeah, it Facebook is. is becoming more of a fickle place because, I'm though I am verified, reach can be skewed. Like, I put up a post this morning, and it wasn't getting traction really damn quick. I went on Facebook Live after it, and that gets a lot more traction. It's interesting. It's a game. Facebook is a continual game because it's an algorithm that is ever-changing. You don't know when it's going to work. Sometimes you do one thing one day, and it does it extremely well. You try to do it again the next day, and it reaches nobody. Yeah. It's it, But... But that's why you have diversification. That is one of the problems with YouTube. A lot of YouTubers never diversified. From day one, I knew that I wanted to have my website and get people back to sign up for my email list. Right. Because if something goes wrong with if YouTube disappears one day, then I still can engage with people through other platforms. Right. And that and that's and that was one of the important mentalities for me was diversification. Instagram is a continual thing. Snapchat continuing to build to build it. Are there certain ones I don't that you shouldn't use? I don't. It, it all depends on where you can interact with people. What works best for you? There's no right or wrong way to do it, but but interactions are important because you engage with your readers. They, they become you turn a fan into a friend, and you have them for life. It's interesting how I. I you're right. The algorithms that you were talking about. Um, Facebook seems to always only promote whatever they're wanting to promote at that time. So if it's, you know, that now that, like before, you know how Facebook started their video feeds. So it used to be when you posted a, a YouTube video, it would show up real big and yep. you could hit play or even autoplay. Now, now they're just tiny little well, boxes. Well, you, you don't want to put a link to YouTube at all on Facebook. You want to upload everything natively. Yeah. You upload videos natively, and some videos do well, and some videos still don't do well. The, what's crazy is I'll take my iPhone, and we talk about that quality thing, right? Yeah. But I'll take my phone, and I'll plug in a Rode video mic micro or whatever that plugs into the right. bottom of the camera, and I'll just take a quick video of a box that came in, take the stuff out, put up that minute and 20 second video, and it will get 100,000 reach. Then I could spend, you could spend a week making another video and you put that up there and it gets like 6,000 and you're punching yourself in the face. Like, why does this shitty boxing video? Ah! Yeah. But, but, that's, but that's the game. You, you just iterate, you just keep going. I, I, I see folks like you and Peter Hurley and, and others really capitalizing on the, the live I'm stream. Peter Hurley. Peter Hurley are my two friends with hair. With good hair, yeah, interesting hair, big hair, big hair, big hair is the word. Um, so that's interesting how, what you said about uh, Periscope and Vine because before that it was Meerkat, right? Well, I jumped on Meerkat really quick as soon as it came out, and I was on their leaderboard for a couple weeks. Oh yeah, because they had a leaderboard for the people that used it, and then Periscope launched right after that, and Meerkat died out. Meerkat just killed their live streaming anyway. Yeah, they're now changing into something else. Yeah. Um, Cool. So so let's jump back to um, the 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 fro factory. Yeah. I'm I'm really curious to 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 hear more about what you plan to do there. Like it, it's it's a big place. T talk a little bit about how big it is and, and well, it's it's a couple floors. It's it's very similar to my loft. It's a little over thirty. I don't know thirty three hundred square feet across multiple floors. Mm -hmm. So there's two, and I'll do a walkthrough when the time is right when it's done with the uh, the the construction that we're doing. The whole idea is to have a place to create that's outside of my loft, which is where I live. Right. I love creating at my loft, but that may bother my neighbors quite a bit sometimes. Does it? Well, yes, <laughs> it does. But I look at it as it's during the day. Right, it's not right. at night. Yeah. But also the separation of business and life is scary for me right now because uh -huh. now I see it coming that my loft is going to be where I live and not just live and work. Uh -huh. And then my business stuff will be a mile and a half down there or a mile point three down the road. It's scary, but it may be good. But it gives me, a, it gives us as a team a place to create, uh -huh. create more, 
do it quicker because we can leave stuff set up that we don't have to break down. You don't have to take an hour out of your time or an hour and a half to set up Raw Talk each right. week when that can be set up and you can just flick a switch and you're ready to go. That hour and a half adds up. You can have numerous sets all over the place. Well, you can have multiple sets. You can, you can, it's like Scott Kelby down in Florida has multiple sets. Right. Five, six, right. seven, eight different sets and they just roll. I'm not, I don't want built sets like that. I'm not, I wanted my set to literally be the loft or, right. or the, the Fro Factory, which has the extremely uh, immense brick walls, exposed brick wood on the ground i want it to be natural as possible sure we'll put in stuff props there to make it work but multiple floors multiple shooting areas that gives me so many new angles to turn to uh -huh. more content to create that's what it is it's about being able to create more content and to make it even better i mean i put out more content than i think the next three four photo youtubers combined uh-huh i think i mean i would imagine lines. there's a lot of videos um i always say that i want to maybe cut back on some but then i'm like but i have them i might as well put them up well so so right now what are you at now like four hundred thousand? like what, what no. in your more it's at four hundred and ninety nine thousand five hundred and sixty. so if gonna, i had we're to we're guess say half a million almost a half a million in two days that's awesome yeah but casey neistat's doing that in every month so so that's what i was gonna say is when like so now that you've reached that, I can imagine, you know, for me, you know, we only have thousands at yeah. this point, you know, just getting to that, you know, 10, 5,000, 10,000. You want more. You want more and more and more. I'm sure you want more. Yeah. Like now that you're going to be, you've got this new factory that you're going to be churning out. Why not just uh, keep it going? Because because the value of, of your brand. So the numbers can be relevant and they can be irrelevant because there's people that fake their numbers. Yeah. And you can tell. So people will look at it and be like, you have a half a million viewers or half a million subscribers. Why are you only getting 10 to 15 percent of them watching a video? Right. Well, that's the that's trends on YouTube. That's how it works now. Mm -hmm. It's not three, four years ago when you could get front paged and have a video get 50, 60,000 views in a matter of hours. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work like that right now. The algorithms there have changed. Right. And there's a lot more people doing it. But, you know, the, the, the fan base that is there. It engages and watches. There's videos that will get 10, 12, 15,000 views when you first put them up, which is fine. And then you have videos that, that blow up over a couple of days. You can see you have two, three, four hundred thousand 400,000 views. And there's no rhyme or reason why a certain video does a certain things. One of my most popular videos was when I spoke at Antonelli and I said, the truth about photography, telling it like it is to a bunch of college students, has six hundred or 700,000 views. And you sit there and you go, why that But that one? broke all the rules of every YouTube post it you're not supposed to have that many things in the title so but it worked like but that's another thing you're really good at is capitalizing on titles and, and I, keyword though? well i mean all of i'm constantly fighting myself with like did i choose the right thing it's well, not I'm, working I'm, I'm sure oh well maybe, maybe is not. It work, you know? i think it is i mean it you know i i well i feel like it is because i see your videos have great numbers on them um but you know if you look at all your videos you kind of get a snippet of really what's going on i've i've learned and, and even started changing the names of how I post my podcast because it'd be this podcast so number whatever with with Jared Poland and people don't necessarily know the name and associate right. or whatever that's but a game have... too so it, it's all a game like it used to be <laughs> it's all a game I used to read word up magazine yeah good <laughs> Brooklyn's in the house over here <laughs> um it used to be different the thumbnail and the title may used to grab people and then over time the same people are seeing similar titles and you have to sometimes put out videos that are engaging just the people that you know are watching and it's not all about the search mm -hmm. you know you look at casey neistat we i look at him all the time because i he's built such an incredible following and his video titles have nothing to do with anything at this point lucky i made it Mm -hmm. but people know to tune in every day yeah and and so if you have that fan base that tunes in for every video then you're going to have them watch there's also videos that i'll put out that are meant to be fishing lines there's a lot a million fishing lines out there to bring people back into the brand mm -hmm. those are videos that aren't meant for everybody where i review a not a re review but do a, a user's guide a free video so like i have a t6 that just showed up and i will make a user's guide tomorrow a free video that may be 30 or 40 minutes just it's basically a user's manual mm -hmm. some people would try to sell it some people would. I put it out for free because it's a fishing pole to lure people in to the rest of the brand. Right. That's what it's about. And I have the ask at the beginning is, by the way, if you haven't signed up for the Fronos Photo email list, just look for this orange box over on the website. Put your name, email that address is... in it and hit send it. And, and so subscribers on the site, yes, yeah, subscribe to me on YouTube. That's great. 
get on my email list. That's the most important, would well, you say? It's one of the most important. Going back, I heard like 10 years ago or in 97, which is more than 10 years ago at this point, uh, open rates may have been 80 to 90 percent of emails got open. Uh -huh. But over the last 15 years, a lot of that's changed because people don't want to give their email addresses. Right. But if you deliver them value and give them a reason to give yeah. you their email address, plus Google will put your emails in spam sometimes right. just because they yeah, feel it knows like it's it. coming from MailChimp or something. Right. And I use it. I use something called AWeber. Aweber. But it, the same thing always happens. The same thing can happen is they don't they don't get there. But I have an open rate of over 30 percent. And I'm hearing that that is tremendous today. Yeah, that's and, like a good a good open rate. And that's because, yes, I have emails that come out that try to sell something from time to time because you have to. That's what you do. But yeah. a lot of it is when you sign up for my email list, like if you go to my email right now or if you go to phronosphoto.com, you look for the orange box that says get a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations. I just redid that guide. It's freaking awesome and it's free. So you get something You get from something it. from it in yeah. exchange. You give me your email address. I'm going to in turn give you education for free. And then if you like my emails, I'm going to at some point say, by the way, sign up for this. Or if you would like to learn more, you could buy this. Yeah. And But but those are fewer and far between, but the whole goal is there's there's an autoresponder sequence. For most people that don't know what an autoresponder sequence is, you sign up for my email list, that starts the clock of the autoresponder. Uh -huh. Email one is scheduled to go out instantly. Email two may show up ten, uh, two days later. Email three, a day after the two days. And, and so the first four emails that I deliver tend to be how to be a better photographer, education, yeah. so that when I do ask for something... You've already given something. I've given a lot. I mean, that's what it's about. And anybody that bitches about free emails or free education, my website is free. Yeah. I sell three guides with the fourth one on the way. If you want to support what I do, please go ahead and make a purchase. If you just like watching the videos, watch them on YouTube. And watch share an them, ad. Yeah. That's fine. You don't, it doesn't cost you anything, but when people start bitching about... Oh, you're you're selling to us. No shit, I'm selling to you. <laughs> I'm giving you thousands upon thousands upon thousands of hours of edu yeah edu edutainment, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> education, uh, infotainment. I, I prefer, but <laughs> giving people all of that, it's like you tune into Netflix, you spend nine ninety nine a month. Of course, there's no ads. You turn on the TV, there's product placements and there's ads. McDonald's is advertising all the freaking time. Coca Cola. It's just like. You see those things. A lot of people don't realize how much work goes into what it is that you do. I mean, it's it, it's not just uh, it's not just it, it's not a hobby. I mean, this is this is full well, time. Well, started off as um, meant to be a hobby. I didn't set out for right. it to be a business. Right. But it but I took it there because it was going there. Right. And that is, it takes a lot of work. Yeah. It really does. And the thing is, you can watch people that have tried to do it, that that fall off. Right. And I and I have friends in the industry that. When they started it, I shook my head and I said, I don't think they have any idea what they're getting into uh -huh. because there is a lot of work. There is a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. So here's a question for you. You've built a persona, yeah. the Fro Knows Photo persona. How much of, of that is me? Is you really? Because <laughs> uh, I know that you can be yeah. kind of shy also. Yeah. Well, I mean, I am that guy. When your hair is down, are you that guy? I'm still well now. Then I feel bad that my hair is down and that I'm doing a disservice to my brand or myself. Oh, I really. That's the shit that goes through my head when I'm out and about it, and I meet somebody. They're like, "Oh my God, Jared Fro, nice to meet you." I'm like, "I'm sorry, my hair is down," <laughs> I'm sorry. and I just feel bad about it. But no, I am mostly. Look, they're on camera. I've raised the level, right? Because that's what you do. That's what you need to do. You need to emote to make it interesting, right? That's one of the things when you go back and watch my early videos, which you can go back and find the oldest videos and see how bad I was on camera. Well, there there was this hilarious video, and I'll maybe the one thousand, the, the, the worst video I ever made, the worst like, video, the worst you video ever I ever made. It was it was incredibly funny. Painful. It was painful to watch, yeah. and incredible to see the 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 difference between then and now. I put that up just to tell people to. Not F off, but just like, look, this is where I started. Right. I started with zero. So that was two years before I had a subscriber. I didn't start then because right. I, I failed so bad at trying to make that video. But I want to show people that this was me. And now I'm sitting here on camera doing it this way. And if I if I can do it, there's no reason why somebody else can't. And that and that was more of why I put that. I have nothing to hide with that. But in terms of persona, I am mostly this guy. But a lot of people will then run into me at a bar or something and realize that I'm just quiet and not drinking and not doing drugs. And they're like, I thought you were going to be the party. I'm like, nah, just <laughs> hanging out. And that's and that's really what it comes down to. So what is what is the big picture? You know, what what's where's Jared five, 10, 15 years from now? So, so there's things that I'm working on that I don't want to get into yet, but continue making content. 
that's I'm not going to stop making content. But there's other avenues through the tech and business and photography world that I want to venture into. Right. And I think that needs to happen. I think you can't be you can't stagnate and do the same thing nonstop. So the, I, I'm looking to go continue what I do. But there is a path that I have that could set the next five years in motion, hopefully soon. Gotcha. You think you'll always be in Philly? Philly man? I mean, I'm, I've am i just bought That's another true. piece of real estate. I think you're pretty much locked in I, for I'm, a bit. I'm locked in, but I'll buy more somewhere else. Yeah. I never thought I could buy something. Mm-hmm. When I first started, I, I like I said, I had $2,000 in the bank. Mm-hmm. Um, and I when I when I signed the, the commitment letter for my, my loft in Philly the first time, my dad was going to have to help me with the down payment. Yeah. Because my site was out for a couple of years, and I was making a little bit of money, but I could barely afford the down payment mm-hmm. with only 10% down, yeah. paying PMI and all that. Yeah. And my dad was going to help me. And he's like, I can help you. We can get there. And, and I would have struggled to do it. I, I uh, then released the Fronos Photo Guide to Getting Out of Auto, which was my first thing that I sold. Mm-hmm. And it was over two years of giving away free content that I sold a guide for 67 bucks, And that came out. And as soon as it came out, I'm like, Dad, I got it. I'm like I got it, and 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 I'm not ashamed. Like I should be happy with that, you know. Being that, cultivate a following, right, and then give value. Like I, I sold that. I, I was selling a video guide because it could help people, right. But it also can help me too. Yeah. I mean that's what it's about. Anybody that thinks that you you're in business to just give shit away, you're not going to be in business long if you're just giving shit away. Even though my site is free, you still can make money. Yeah. And that's, well, and that's right. the business side of it. I right. love business. And be, beyond, also one other thing, beyond just cash money, there's there's a lot of value in, in other well, things. like Partnerships, the, partnerships and, and, and connections. friends and people that you meet that allow you to get at, like <laughs> Danny Clinch, right? You know Danny? Not personally. I interviewed Danny. Uh-huh. Go back six or seven years before, like a couple years before the website, I wanted to spend a day with Dan. Uh I emailed his assistant. I emailed his assistant. I emailed his assistant. I emailed his assistant, and it never happened because I had nothing to offer. Mm -hmm. And I I get that. It's the same thing when people email me, like, I want to spend a day with you. I'm like, what the fuck are you going to spend a day? I'm busy. Yeah. So then I reached back out a couple years. Last year, I'm like, you have a book coming out. What I did is I reviewed his book. I bought mm-hmm. the book. It's a great book. Mm-hmm. I reviewed it, made sure he saw it on Twitter. And, s- and also saw that it had v- you know, all these views and stuff. Well, sees that that, that has more views than the, than the, 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 the publisher's videos right, ever right. have. And, and so I had more value to offer. Yeah. So I reached out back to I said, the woman's contact still, mm-hmm. sent her an email, said, hey, I did this review. I'd love to get Danny on my podcast. Here's the information. We'd love to come up to New York. And we made it happen. But that's because took it from not having anything and gave him a reason right I mean, it, that that's how it works that's how it works it, it gives done. you the connections and and the thing with the photo shoots i can shoot what i want because i can trade like a musician comes to town you know they're not looking they're, they're not paying you they don't want to pay you sometimes most of the time they don't want to spend money uh-huh. but if i can go to a new band and say hey look um I'm going to, I'd like to come and spend the day with you. All access, no questions asked. Let me do what I do. Here's what I've done before. Look at all this other work. I'm going to give you access to the images, which is I know you don't like stuff like this. And, and the other guys that you had on a couple of weeks ago were all about we want we, you know value getting paid and all that. For me, it's a little different because I can add value by doing it for nothing. I can get paid somewhere else by delivering free content to people and then getting thanked other ways that's my mentality but i can go to a band and say i'll give you these photos to use online for free if you want to purchase them for other use that's perfectly fine too but what do i get out of it i get access i get more photos i can test gear i can share share my stories with the readers at home educate you can use some of their celebrity in a way or a lot of times my following is larger than theirs and they end up getting new listeners right i mean that's it's a it's a it's a give and take that's right. what you do you ask you get you give you get you know you right just, the more you give the more you end up getting it's it's crazy how that works sometimes. right right there's a difference between like those guys were editorial photographers you know we're, we're talking about their editorial contracts and stuff. yeah they should all become one of us internet personality peoples <laughs> yeah man you're doing it well you know you're, you're taking a path i mean but you you shoot a ton i yeah i still shoot a lot but it becomes a dilemma it does become a dilemma. It becomes a dilemma because uh, you know doing these podcasts and and you know creating this content and and constantly putting on events and stuff takes a lot of time. So you it know, does. We're, we're, well, it does take time, but you have to. 
what makes you happy is what it comes down to. Right. You can't be beholden to other people saying, well, you're an asshole because you're taking jobs away from people. You're not taking jobs away from people. You still do your gigs. I occasionally get calls and turn them down or take them. But this is I, th I personally love doing this. Didn't expect to be sitting here doing this. What you know? Talk about struggling out of college. You make twenty four thousand dollars doing photography in a year. Yeah, it's not a lot, right? You know, and and that was a struggle to make that money. And I was just shooting for Rolling Stone as a freelancer, making four hundred bucks a gig. You're shooting for Rolling Stone, getting four hundred bucks a gig. Is that that good? Can you make money off the prestige? You have to. You have to earn it. Yeah. You know, you have to take that prestige and use it to your advantage. But four hundred bucks doesn't go a long way. Yeah, certainly. I just got today, yesterday in the mail, a check from the Washington Post. Twelve cents for seventeen fifty. Seventeen dollars and fifty cents for a photo they used. For some photo that they licensed to Getty, they they got used, and uh, you know, and that pisses you off, doesn't it? It, it does it? piss me off. And because you know? I had the same thing. It was a Zuma Press back in the day. Yeah. I know Kelby shoots with Zuma Press. I got a check one day for. 20 bucks uh -huh. for a photo that ran of Mariah Carey. And I was like, I called him on the phone. I said, take all my shit off your site. Like, I'm not going to do this for 20 bucks. Yeah. I'm like, what? It's not going to add up. There's yeah. so many people taking these photos. And th and that's why those agencies, they're great. They'll get your stuff out there, but they're also not, they, they're, it used to be you'll get $250. And then it was like, oh, now you're getting 20. They'll take whatever they can get because for them, they get half of it or whatever the percentage yeah. split is. And they don't care because it's aggregate. Yeah. But as a photographer, you get screwed. But you could bitch about it, and you could try to find lawyers, and you could try to do all this other bullshit about changing the way that the times are moving, or you could figure out how to be successful on your own and get out of the burden of having to work for other people. Mm -hmm. Drop the goddamn mic. Oh, excuse sorry. Drop the GD microphone. <laughs> I'm even PCing myself here. They're hooked up. You can't drop them. So. No, and they're road broadcasters. They are. I use the same ones. And um, I get emphatic. I know, I can but tell. But I get passionate, but you know what I'm talking about. I do, and I, I, think, I, think, I think that it's it's important to, to say that, you know, there there is value in other things than just cash. Not, not saying that, you know, people shouldn't get paid for what they do, but there is value um, that can be found, in that, and that's personal. It's a personal choice whether that, you know, that value is worth it to you to, to not take the cash or whatever. Sure, so, but, it but it's becoming harder and harder for these guys to, to get jobs. Because there's a lot of people coming up, like especially in the concert world, doing it for nothing. Right. Which I'm part to blame for that because I educate people on how to get into shows to do them. Right. And part of the problem is also the people that are letting people into the shows don't vet them. The PR people aren't doing their jobs. Yeah. They aren't making sure they're letting the right people in that don't have iPhones. Not that there's anything wrong with shooting with an iPhone, but you shouldn't be in the pit shooting with a freaking iPhone. It's true. And you can take some pretty decent photos with an iPhone, too. I so what drives shit out of the iPhone in a pit. I've done it before. But it's it. It's. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be in there. It's just saying that, generally speaking, right. when you see somebody in the pit with an iPhone holding it above their head, they don't belong. Right. No, no, totally. I'm just thinking, like, it's funny how, you know, uh, the, the artists won't let a f person bring a real camera into a show. Yeah, they're in their okay front with camera with an iPhone or something that's creating poster quality images. Or just capturing the worst images instead of letting people. But I get the whole Beyonce thing. Beyonce was one that said no photographers. It's perfectly fine because she hires her own photographer for the event and then they put the images out. Mm -hmm. And yeah, people are upset about that or signing contracts to the Foo Fighters. Not that I um, get another call from the manager to yell at me again. Maybe. That's a whole nother story. That's a, definitely a story that that I'll save for another time for you. <laughs> uh, we should have had you at a at the panel to talk about that situation. I would have gotten yelled at by somebody oh, sitting yeah. on the panel. There's no doubt about it. I know it. who would have yelled at me. Yeah? Yeah. Well, um, so have we not I – mean, we've got to get going because I've got a, got a call coming up and everything. What is there anything that we haven't talked about that we said we were going to talk about or that you want to bring up? No. No? Well, you ask questions, I answer them. Hey. That's my goal. Cool. Well, um, before we before we leave, is there anybody that has any any good questions? Only good ones. No good questions. Okay. Oh, where's one? Go ahead. Yeah. Do you want me to answer yeah. that after the show? Um, the yeah. question is, there's, there's a gentleman, because I'm sure they can't hear at home, so I repeat the question. <laughs> gentleman in the back asks, he does podcasting, he's talking about uh, email bl uh, 
blasts, how does he get something like that? There's a bunch of different services that are out there today. You've got MailChimp. You've got, uh, I use what's called AWeber, and they give you up to 5,000 names on it for free. And then after that, you start paying some money. But the reason that you don't want to just send emails out as a blast email on your own email account is that you will get blacklisted if you send too many emails in a certain amount of time. These companies that you're paying to do this, like MailChimp and AWeber, are verified. They have licenses to serve emails massively out there. So they're verified, they're vetted, and that's why you're paying them money to do it. So something like AWeber or MailChimp allows you to do all of that stuff. Awesome. Well, um, thank you so much for, for being on here. Thanks again to Canon Professional Services, Adorama, Tenba, Rode Microphone, and most importantly, the Fro himself, Jared Poland. Thank, thank you. you so much for being on. Thanks for having me. All right. And we'll see you all again next time. Oh, subscribe to our uh, YouTube page. I'm supposed to say that, right? Uh, well, ask for it, but by this point, they're probably not listening They anymore. probably tuned out. So. All right. See you all next time. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>